So my job is grass taxonomist at Kew Gardens, and I've been doing that for over 10 years already. Um, and I pretty much spent 10 years studying the grasses of Madagascar, very basic, what we call alpha taxonomy, which is trying to understand how many species of grasses are there and how are they different from one another. Um, I just want to do a quick check. Can everybody hear me okay? How are we doing? Okay, okay I'm not seeing Caroline wave, so I'll assume that we're okay. okay um, I, yeah, yeah, good, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So I realized that I actually spoke to the South London Botanical Institute about my research in 2015. Um, and this time the talk will be different. So I'm not going to be speaking about grasses specifically or about research results, but I'll be bringing together things that were new to me, which I learned throughout various trips across Madagascar. Um, I think I did about 13 trips to date. Um, and I'd like to invite you to join me um, for a grass collecting field trip in Madagascar. So we're all going to embark on this journey together. And um, I won't blame any of you if you haven't really heard about Madagascar before or you don't know much about the island because most of the time Madagascar is it's a place which is of interest only to biologists so if you are a biologist Madagascar is an amazing paradise island the vast majority of plants and animals in Madagascar are completely unique and endemic to Madagascar. So there's almost 10,000 endemic plant species and that's about 85% of all the species diversity. Um, so what I'm telling you now should be in line with your impressions of Madagascar as a, as a biologist. And so we are starting off our journey in the southwestern corner of Madagascar here. This is what we call the spiny forest. The baobabs um, are the big trees you see in the middle of the slide. Um, and then you see some Didieraceae, which are a bit like a weird spiny cactus pointing their spiny fingers at you. So it's a very, very unique and strange ecosystem. Um, and here is our colleague Nanja, um, very nearby. And um, in, in a little circle there, which you should be able to see, she's looking for what different kind of grasses support the local livelihoods in this part of the island. So the trees you see in the background are actually euphorbia, big spiny euphorbia trees. And people who live in this part of the island are dependent mainly on cattle raising for their livelihoods. So the front part of the slide is a big pasture. Um, it's very dry and drought really limits how much food it's possible to produce. And after a while, all of us together, we find this pretty strange plant here, which we suspect might be Dicariella. Maybe it's this really amazing rare grass which only occurs in Madagascar. But we don't know that. So we'll need to take it back to the capital city and to the herbarium to identify it. So we return from our very hot and tiring day. We're all sweaty, going back to the local town to have dinner. Um, and going to the local town, um, we realize that really we're quite a bizarre presence here in a forgotten part of southwestern Madagascar. So this is what most of the houses look like. The village we're staying in, called Sihombe, doesn't actually have electricity. Um, and local people are quite surprised to see us. So this is, uh, this is a big four by four car that we turned up in. Um, and this is our driver on the roof. These are all the bags that we've taken with us. And we're unpacking the bags. And um, as the bags are unpacked, I guess I often think how different the world looks um, from the point of view of the people living here, like to most people here, Southwest Madagascar experiences more hunger than any other part of the island, so it's even poorer than the rest of the country, which is already the most poor country in the world, not currently at war. So really, the pretty lemurs and the amazing baobabs 
don't have much immediate relevance to whether you're able to feed your family. Okay, so next we're going to have dinner. If I can manage to change this slide. Hmm. Um, so now we are staying in a house just like this one, and uh, this is the house of our hostess. Let me just check in with you. Can everybody hear me okay? I yeah. would think that is a yes. So for dinner, we are going to have rice. Um, this is pretty much a guaranteed um, feature of every trip in Madagascar. So in the middle of the left-hand side of this, this is a very traditional Malagasy house, particularly in coastal areas. So the house is on stilts, it's up above sand and it'll be okay when it floods. And you see a traditional aluminium big pot, which is making really large, satisfying portion of rice for everybody. Um, so when people first came to Madagascar. We think that people came originally from Indonesia via the Indian coast and one of the plants that people brought with them when they arrived in Madagascar is rice and ever since then the food culture in Madagascar is very much centered around growing and eating rice. So Madagascar has the highest consumption of rice in the world and as we seeing this rice prepare um, I remember that I read a World Bank report on Madagascar recently and the biggest cause of death across the country as a whole and compared to other countries is indoor air pollution. So what tends to happen in houses like these is people who are sick and people who are vulnerable stay indoors, then all the cooking tends to be done on an open fire like this indoors. And that's, that's really bad for your health, that's not great. Um, and on this particular field trip um, that we are on, um, so let me let me introduce you to some of the team. So our our host and the owner of the house is on the left. In the middle is um, Tina Randriambuvaunji, and she is our conservation specialist. Um, so she's a botanist and a Q staff member based in Madagascar. Uh, we've now moved on to dessert and we're having amazing local coffee and on the right is Guillaume Besnard who's my French colleague and he's a population geneticist. By this point in the trip all of us and all of you um, have quite a bad stomach and keeping food down is a little bit difficult because one consequence um, of the water shortages in this part of Madagascar is when all the restaurants and when everybody prepares food, running water is not available like it would be even in other parts of Madagascar. So maintaining hygiene and cleanliness is harder, shall we say. So even experienced Malagasy botanists who travel with us have bad stomach. Um, how did we get here and how are we going back to the capital city? So we set off back on our road and this is what the road looks like. So most roads in Madagascar were actually built before the country became independent before 1960 and not much road maintenance has been done since. Um, and on top of that, if we think about the difficulty, the livelihoods difficulty for local people. This is a road where very rich foreigners like us go by in their fancy vehicles every now and again. Um, and if I need to feed my family, I will do literally anything I can to get money for that. So a business opportunity often is removing bits of wood from a bridge like this one. Then we have to stay um, and negotiate basically and maybe pay a bit of money to people to rebuild this bridge again to enable us to get back home. And um, I just want to explain that the reason I'm giving you all of these details is um, I, want to, I want to bring this trip alive to all of you to see really what it is like to travel across Madagascar. But at the same time, I hope this will help us understand how disadvantage and inequality works in the real world. There are so many things that are different and all of these things add up to make Madagascar science be quite a different process with different outcomes. So a bit further along, we have some trouble on the bridge. 
um, when this happened to us, it was really rather not funny um, because the driver who was working with us wasn't very experienced. He hurried across the bridge and the car almost fell through halfway over. And the colleague that you see on this slide is uh, Dr. Frank Rakotana Sol, who is the world expert on the coffee family in Madagascar. And he's one of the most knowledgeable Malagasy botanists that we have. He knows an immense amount, especially about tropical forest trees. But the reality of being a scientist in Madagascar is Frank can't spend his time just thinking about the taxonomy of tropical trees. Um, Frank has to be an expert in how to get your vehicle out of this kind of situation on the bridge. So we're incredibly lucky to have Frank with us on this trip and eventually we're able to get the car out with the help of quite a number of people. Um, and again, coming back from southern Madagascar, we are really quite lucky um, because the Malagasy word Dahal um, stands for armed bandits, which are largely the result of basically financial insecurity and people needing to do anything they can to survive in southern Madagascar. I was quite shocked to see that there's now a computer game called Dahal. And um, if you download this computer game, apparently it'll tell you about real life in the south of Madagascar. Uh, so after all of this, um, we are quite relieved to get back home. We're pretty tired after this trip. The stomach isn't great. We spent much more money than we were anticipating. It took longer than we were anticipating. We, we are happy to have collected our interesting grass. We are happy to have not gotten on the wrong side of the bandits. We have a little celebration with the Kew Madagascar Conservation Center. Um, we started working with botanists um, in Madagascar. Kew started in 1999. So these are just a few um, of the 40 uh, Q staff that work in Madagascar right now. Um, so Nanja, who was doing the grass diversity plot in the second slide, she's here at the front on the left. So time is moving on, so I'll try and get through this more quickly. Um, we brought a grass back from South Madagascar with us, and now we need to identify it. So to identify a grass, we have to go to a herbarium to compare it to other specimens. Um, so here we are uh, from, from our office in Antananarive, it's the capital of Madagascar, to go to the herbarium. Um, during rush hour, it takes one to two hours sitting in the traffic. And we tend to think that traffic jams are trivial and they don't really do any harm. But thinking about the example in Antananarive, the amount of time it takes to get from A to B is such that the amount of work you can do is severely curtailed. So being out here after dark is really not recommended. And at the same time as being unsafe in the dark, it's also... So in a private vehicle, in an expensive car, it's okay, but most people travel on buses. And carrying an expensive laptop on a bus, it's not really such a good idea. Um, so we noticed that actually our local colleagues can't get any work done in the evenings because they can't take their computers home from the office. And their working hours are very restricted because of how the logistics work out. Um, so this building is the biggest herbarium in Antananarive um, in the botanical garden in central Madagascar. And uh, we arrive here hoping to identify our grass. And of course what we need to do grass identification well is a microscope. This is a picture of Lucy Smith, who's, uh, who's an amazing artist, wo artist working at Kew Gardens now. And this is a picture of her actually looking at one of my Malagasy grasses and dissecting it. The, the interesting thing about grasses and microscopes is to most people, all grasses look the same. It's difficult to see the difference really. But the better your microscope, the better you can see the difference. So if you take a hundred times dissecting microscope and put very boring looking grasses under it, you will be amazed how they come alive and what kind of detail you see. But without a high powered microscope, basically the worse your microscope technology, the harder it is to see anything in your grass. 
and of course one off kind donation of money to buy a microscope buys your microscope but it does not buy you professional maintenance of your microscope which has to be done by somebody who knows about microscopes every six months or at least every year really so we we have having quite a difficult time identifying our grass because um this is also a photograph from Lucy's work. You can see the critical bits we need to see in our grass are at the top of the slide looking like little speckles and they're upper florets and they're, they're less than one millimeter long. And you can see them in comparison to this pencil. It's quite difficult to see, but we try. Um, and now you should be seeing a slide with many herbarium specimens laid out. And we come to a thing which I think many British and European botanists find quite surprising to think because in Britain, as we go through our education system, all British plants can be identified using books and using internet. So in London, going through a book is usually enough to identify a plant or high level of confidence. But for the majority of tropical regions, it's simply not true because the resources that have been put together for British plants simply don't exist for Madagascar. The only way we can identify our grass is by comparing it to pre-existing specimens of Malagasy grasses. So we try, these are specimens that we're looking at at the Madagascar herbarium, but actually only three quarters of the grasses have any specimens at all in the herbarium and we are unlucky our grass is one of the 25 percent of the diversity that doesn't have any specimens um, why doesn't it have any specimens because all the specimens were removed and housed in paris um, so this is a photograph of the jardin de plant the big botanical garden in paris where these collections are kept um, and that's everything that was collected in Madagascar prior to 1948. Um, so many people know that specimens were removed from diversity rich countries and held in Europe. But where the specimens physically located are not all the rest of the story. Um, remotely done science has a lot of consequences that we don't fully understand. Um, for example, in this picture, you see a grass which is called Panicum subhistrix. Under a rock, this grass has narrow leaves and it doesn't have any hairs. When it comes out from, from under the rock, it becomes hairy, like you can see, and the leaves are wider. So if you take this grass and you chop this up into different specimens, it looks like many different things. And the scientist who gave names to Malagasy grasses, uh, Madame Amy Camus, she worked in Paris Herbarium for many years. She did some excellent work, but she's never visited Madagascar at all. Um, so she gave four different names to this species, working essentially from different morphology bits of the same plant. And um, this kind of difficulty would never happen in Britain, because in Britain we live alongside the plants that we work with and we look at them every day. So we still haven't managed to identify our possible Dicariella and what are we going to do? So um, we go online and we buy some long distance plane tickets for when the coronavirus is over. Um, and this is literally the world map of the herbarium collections that I've had to visit to understand Malagasy plants. So from Madagascar in green, I have to go to France in orange for, for, um, for the main collection of Malagasy plant specimens to make sure that my identification from Madagascar is congruent with grasses of Africa. The biggest tropical African herbarium is in queue in Britain, that's in red, and the biggest herbarium for South Africa is in Pretoria over in blue. So if we think about how that looks like from the point of a graduate student in Madagascar, the, Malagas the student in Madagascar is actually not going to be able to complete this work at all. Um, so we've identified our grass and um, we've made some more records of grasses in Madagascar. And it was interesting for me to compare how does the knowledge differ between Madagascar and Britain. So the most common grass in Britain is the Yorkshire fog, Holcus lanatus. The Botanical Society of British Isles 
records plants from every kilometer square. And that's what you see in this image, um, common grass records from every kilometer square. And now let's compare this to the most commonly known grass in Madagascar. So the most common grass in Madagascar has been recorded just under 300 times compared to 300,000 times for Britain. And you can see as a lot of Madagascar is inaccessible, it's not actually able, we're not able to tell very well where the species really occurs. On this slide is a kind of funny comparison of British grass records and the Malagasy grass records. Um, Madagascar is about twice as big as Britain by land area. It has approximately twice as many grass species, but the total number of records observed for Madagascar basically never gets off the bottom of the graph. Okay, so um, we've made some records. Uh, we've gotten depressed about how many plant records are available for Madagascar. We're ready for our second field trip. Is everybody ready? <laughs> okay, so this time we go north and we go east to some rainforest um, and we encounter a flood um, in our way, which we didn't anticipate. And um, these kind people are taking across vehicles on canoes. So for about for about 10 pounds, we can get our car taken across the flood on these boards. So do we think we should go for it or not? It's a pity there isn't a vote function. <laughs> um, as it happens, our driver decided that it really wasn't safe at all. So we rapidly replan our second field trip and we decide to go to a different place. Um, and um, the different place is better, comparatively kind of better. And this is a very common site in Madagascar in the wet season. And the person you see in the front of my slide is um, Roger Rajonarison. Um, in Madagascar, we always have to work with specialist driver mechanic engineers because for a botanist to do their own driving, it's a bit difficult in these kinds of circumstances. And um, in this slide, you see Roger looking unhappy in his gaiters because he's realized that in order for us to get through this road, he will have to pull the trucks out of the mud first with the winch and the Land Rover, um, which basically takes a day out of our timetable. So we, we arrive in the forest with some very wonderful lemurs. Everybody loves lemurs. Uh, we're back in the biologist's paradise again and on the understory of the forest um, do you see little plants with fronzy leaves they look a little bit like small palms so this is what endemic forest grasses look like in Madagascar biologically speaking they're grasses and they arrived and differentiated in Madagascar maybe 10 18 million years ago so we are very preoccupied with our forest grasses, so we're not really paying attention. Um, and then you look at your arm and you notice, um, so do we know what this kind of local wildlife is? Um, it's a forest leech, yeah. So often by the time you notice you're covered in blood and it's quite itchy and, and somewhat unpleasant. So we try to get out of that forest and. Um, so we're sort of bleeding and quite tired and we're late again. But finally we find what we think is a new species of bamboo. And this is actually a bamboo that you very commonly see tourists going past in Madagascar. That has no scientific name at all, has never been described. Bamboos are so difficult to identify a name that nobody has even attempted to ever give it a Latin name. It's a kind of thing that's pretty much inconceivable in European botany. Okay, so I'm going to finish up and um, we are returning back to the capital city and we're going to publish a new paper describing our new species. Um, so what happens next? We need to talk to our colleagues at the University of Antananarive, um, but of course the Malagasy education system happens in a mixture of um, Malagasy and French and then people have to write papers in English. So. I'd like to invite everybody to think what is their third best language and then so for me my first language is Russian then my second language is English and probably French is the third best I find it very difficult to write a paper in French <laughs> um, 
um, and at the university we try to read some relevant taxonomic papers on other species which you always need to read scientific papers in order to write your own paper and many journals and electronic establishments they try to make things available for free to colleagues in African institutions which is a fantastic thing to do except the reality in many places like Madagascar is um, that the university doesn't have the resources to maintain a computer network and the university does not have resources to give people email addresses so it's effectively impossible to verify our colleagues as university staff so actually we can't see herbarium specimens on JSTOR because that's behind a paywall and we can't read papers in scientific journals which are not open access which is quite difficult we try to do some video conferencing um, but we're a bit stuck um, so none of our Malagasy colleagues were able to come and listen to this talk today even though I offered to set up connections for people because the internet is simply far too expensive in people's homes in Madagascar to make this possible and I say this to point out the fact that a better understanding of how reality works on the ground and a better understanding of detail that might seem unimportant can allow us to make things more equal and help botanists in places like Madagascar better. Um, so finally we've submitted that paper for publication and um, this, is a, this is a graph I found interesting which uh, my colleagues um, put together for all the vertebrate papers about Madagascar. So you can see that ever since 1959, the grey papers led by non-Malagasy institutions have outnumbered anything the Malagasy botanists are able to publish. Um, and I think having seen what we've seen just now, this situation isn't particularly surprising. Uh, this is an analysis that was published by Mayer in 2015. Um, I allowed myself two graphs in this talk, so I promise no more graphs after this. This shows a positive correlation between how much income a country has and the completeness of its biodiversity inventory. So all African countries with Madagascar are in purple, low GDP, and not much hope of a complete inventory of biodiversity. Um, so we've done a reasonable job. Uh, we are quite tired after our two field trips. We published a paper on a new species. Um, and we just, I just want to sum up um, what Kew and Missouri Botanical Garden, what we've done to try to help the situation in Madagascar so far. And to me, the statistics are very impressive. So we think that a total of 250 local staff have been trained by Missouri and Q since the 1990. Nowadays, two thirds of all collections are made by Malagasy botanists. Uh, the map on the left hand side of this slide is a Missouri Botanical Garden analysis of which parts of Madagascar is it most important to protect? Um, so everything which is in green are new protected areas and many of these are now Missouri and Q protected areas as you see on the right hand side. So Missouri Botanical Gardens um, are a private American institution and globally they have made the biggest contribution to botany in Madagascar to date, far bigger than Q and far bigger than any other organization. And at the moment they're running community-based conservation projects in 13 sites. Okay, so um, to finish off, I just want to say thank you to everybody in Madagascar for teaching me all these things. And sorry to not have any of you here in this talk Maybe, maybe I should add that at the moment, Antananarive and many cities in Madagascar are under second lockdown. Uh, this is now week three of second lockdown because of the very difficult coronavirus situation. Um, and I hope that we can fix up our communications to all really be in this together, at least virtually, in spite of the coronavirus. Thank you very much.